Good morning. Uh, my name is Joel Kaplan. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of the participants. I'm the executive director of the BC Council for Families. We have participants from all over the province for the call today. I want to explain a little bit about how we got here today. Um, we had identified that there was a need from a variety of sources to develop resources to support service providers working with mothers with mental health, substance use, and other life challenges and their young children and families. Funding was provided by the government as part of the implementation of Healthy Minds, Healthy People, the 10-year plan to address mental health and substance use in BC. The council, the BC Council for Families, was asked to be the executive sponsor. A provincial steering and advisory committee were established with broad representation. And the Growing Together Toolkit <clears throat> was developed and incorporated from the feedback from the two committees and from the focus groups of some mothers. Um, I'd like to also take this um, opportunity to thank Janet Williams, who was the project coordinator, Len Lenora Marsalis, who was the writer, and Tina Albrecht from the BCC, from the council staff, who uh, worked on the design of the Growing Together Toolkit. The focus of today's webinar is to familiarize you with the toolkit and to discuss ways that it might be utilized with different organizations. And I would now like to introduce our orientators. Um, firstly, Lenora, our writer for the project, is an associate professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Victoria. She has a clinical background in neonatal nursing. Her research focuses on the care and support of women with multiple social challenges, including substance use, mental health challenges, violence, and trauma, and their infants. Leela Barge has worked as a family programs coordinator at Frog Hollow Neighborhood House for the past 12 years with a degree in special education and with an ECE BC license to practice she has also worked as an infant development consultant, a supported childhood development coordinator, and a special education teacher in all these roles. She has seen the importance of promoting mental health development in infants and young children. Lastly, a commercial. I would like to encourage each and every one of you to engage and get involved in setting up your organizational or professional premium free account and affiliation on our new collaborative BCCF website at bccf.ca. There are so many features and benefits to the website for the nonprofit sector in BC. And if you would like a tour, let me know and we can arrange it for you. We would also like to arrange for a link from your own um, website to ours with regards to the toolkit or any of our other resources. Um, lastly, um, for information purposes, the um, toolkit is in the process of being translated into Korean, Punjabi, Spanish, and simplified Chinese and will be posted in those languages shortly. And should we have any other budget, we will uh, advise as to whether or not it will be posted in other languages. Or if you have any suggestions, let us know. Thank you. All right, thanks, Joel. Joel's good at promotion. <laughs> All right, there we go. So, um, Lee and I are sitting here in the offices of the BC Council for Families, so thank you for hosting us. Janet is peeking at us over the top of the computer. 
um, who has been helping us move this project forward. And uh, so thanks to Joel and Janet for hosting us. And uh, Lee and I have really enjoyed uh, the last stages of getting this together and, yes. and trying it out and getting it out to you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how the uh, toolkit was developed. Um, I'll start out with a little bit of background and I'll walk you through part of the toolkit. And then Lee's been um, field testing, field testing us. So um, you'll get lots of tips, uh, handy tips on how to use this in your own practice. Um, just so you know, we're going to tag team. So we're going to dive in on each other. We did one of these yesterday and we actually had more of a conversation than a formal presentation. And we're keeping our eye on the, the chat section. So if you chat in a specific question, please let us know and we will talk about it there or somewhere along where it comes into the conversation. One question we had yesterday was, will the PowerPoint be available? And uh, what the BC Council for Families will do, uh, we're recording right now, and so the, um, the, the recording with the PowerPoint will be posted. And we'll also post, post the PowerPoint for you, and we're quite happy to have you uh, individualize it to your program and your context and actually uh, use it, use it, use it. So that was the goal of a lot of these tools. So the context for this project, uh, why and how, Joel mentioned a little bit about the, the start. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening uh, at um, kind of policy levels very briefly, but just to let you know that our first step when we got together as a large steering group and a large advisory group was to uh, look and see what else was around there. And that actually gave us a, a big pause moment because mm -hmm. when we got out there searching, we found there were a uh, significant amount of really excellent resources. So uh, what we did do is actually um, put all of those together in an additional resource for you that's on the website uh, called the Environmental Scan. And it goes through uh, a lot of resources that are available on the web for you. So in addition to what we'll talk about today, uh, I'll encourage you to go and look there. There's a, just amazing um, yes, literature yeah. and videos, all kinds of things available for you. That, certainly the interest in this field has been growing. And uh, we were talking yesterday about how I've been a nurse for, uh, I'll, I'll disclose, <laughs> <laughs> this is my 30, 31st year wow. of being a nurse. And I started working in an NICU in 1988. Uh, we talked, never talked about mental health. We no. never talked about substance use no. or any of those determinants no. of health. It was strictly no. very biomedical. And, and you're saying the same thing. And well, yeah. in the education field too. Mm -hmm. uh, I started off as a special ed teacher and there wasn't a lot of, Looking even at the family or anything, it was uh, very educational based. So uh, it's very uh, rewarding to see how things have changed and how we are changing our focuses. Mm -hmm. And what's very exciting is that this interest is happening uh, cross-sectorally as well. And so um, as you can see from who was participating on the steering committee and advisory committee, very broad um, representation and uh, diverse participation from many fields. So hopefully these resources will will be applicable uh, far and wide and be able to use them with other tools. And actually later in the um, webinar, I will uh, share some of the um, information that's online and how I've used it actually on the field. And so it's out there and we might as well use it because it's great. Okay. So in case you're wondering why that picture is there, <laughs> this is where the paper started wrestling yesterday. It was a little bit convoluted conversation, but that's Lombard uh, Street for any of you who've been to San Francisco. And I just went there with my sister in the, in the, the fall last year. And uh, it just reminded us of our, our early days, but we were really trying to sort out what is the audience for this toolkit. And so um, this particular um, toolkit is for early childhood providers who are doing a lot of frontline work. Those of you who may be public health um, nurses or other uh, members online, there's also some more work being done on an additional project focused on public health. There's also been work, and I'll show you a slide later on through the Healthy uh, Child Alliance uh, that's targeted towards social workers, different groups. So trying to come up with um, a range of resources that are connected, um, but relevant for different groups in different sectors. So just very briefly, um, as we are certainly hearing more and more about all the time, that increased awareness of the significant, um, the significant impact of mental health issues and how they begin in childhood or adolescence. And I know teaching on a, a university campus, it's been a huge initiative across the country looking at mental health for, um, for young people on campuses. Uh, we, um, we estimate that about 1.2 million Canadian children and youth are affected by mental illness. 
and um, most significant, a very small number of those will receive appropriate treatment for many reasons. You'll hear us talking about uh, stigma, stigma yeah. uh, throughout this talk today. Um, lack of services. Lack of services, mm -hmm. even lack of awareness. Yeah. There's a lot more education happening around the country. And the lifetime cost of childhood mental health uh, estimated to be about $200 billion in Canada. And if we think about um, life course impact and intergenerational impact, it's um, very significant. So I'm going to start really big and then um, come right down into BC and uh, just to kind of demonstrate how um, there's been increased attention in the last five to ten years on this issue. World Health Organization, some of you may have heard of the Millennium Development Goals, is a, a series of goals that are intended to improve health worldwide. And uh, a piece of that, a very important piece, is around improving maternal health. Uh, in many countries around the world, uh, low resource countries, the uh, maternal and infant morbidity and mortality is startling. Um, a lot of that is, is related to more physiological things, but there's been a lot of awareness around mental health and the importance of that globally, not just here in Canada and BC. And um, also really uh, an increased awareness of the impact of maternal mental health on the growth and development of infants and young children and continued kind of growth and development of families. Here in Canada, we had our first mental health strategy released in 2012. Uh, nationally, developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and it builds on earlier framework, um, mental health framework uh, work that was done. Their goal is that all people living in Canada do have the opportunity to achieve their best possible mental health and well-being. Uh, on the next slide, I just have the strategic directions from that document. I'm not going to read them all to you. I just wanted to highlight that um, in one of the um, directions, they are looking at mental health across the lifespan. And many people actually that we work with and the general public would not think about including infants yeah. in, in that lifespan piece. So it's, um, a, some advocacy and awareness work for us to uh, let people know that infants fall into that piece yeah. and fostering that recovery for people of all ages. Um, again, in that document, they are, are increasing our awareness that infants and children are included in the this life course perspective, and that the focus from that developmental point of view is the concept of resilience, which we will talk about a little bit yeah. and they will mention um, from a practice perspective mm -hmm. on how we promote and support that development of that capacity in young children uh, for their overall well-being and for mental health uh, as well. This is our plan here in BC, and it feels like it was just released, but you know, this is the fifth year that it's been out. There's been a lot of, um, lot of work across different sectors looking at mental health and substance use in BC. Uh, I was working with the Ministry of Health at the time when a lot of the foundational work for this was, was being planned. Then I was in a health authority setting where we were doing some implementation and planning and looking at what we were doing. And, uh, and it's been really great to work with this team on something very specific uh, that fits into this big plan. The priorities for BC and very clearly the uh, concept of mental health in early childhood starting in that phase um, was um, highlighted. And we were those of us who work in this field were really excited to yes. see yeah. uh, pregnancy and early childhood uh, included in this life course look. And um, a quick quote on the right there you'll see is that we know that this the stronger the foundation you lay in early childhood, the, the bigger the lifelong impact it has for the well-being of individuals, families, yeah. and communities. Yeah. We're also uh, pleased to see that they're acknowledging substance use, and those of us who work a lot with families will know that often mental health and substance use challenges okay. can yeah. come hand in hand. Chicken and an egg thing, sometimes exactly. you never know what exactly. comes first, but... Yeah. Um, they can often um, occur concurrently, and you need to address them both at the same time. Uh, we would also toss um, violence and trauma in there, exactly. most likely. I would is yeah. that, that kind of three-legged stool where you need to look at all of those things together. Um, important, too, that they're acknowledging the impact of stigma and discrimination in our communities, and that there's a big education piece uh, across as broad as we can, yes. general public, yeah. students, schools, health, every social support everywhere um, many of you may have seen this but from the in the health sector 
there was a framework almost 10 years ago <clears throat> released looking at um, how we improve our services and coordination related to perinatal depression, just to let you know that that is there. And uh, an excellent resource. If you haven't seen it, many of you may have. I can't, we were, were we talking what year this uh, was released? I should have put the year on five, there. It was five, five years ago. Maybe? Five years ago, yeah. Um, I just want to do a heads up for this um, the social emotional development in early years. I've used it a lot, and it fits in just very well with this um, toolkit as well. Um, I use them interchangeably and. If you go to the website, it's a wealth of information and some really great videos that anybody can use with staff training or parenting classes. And it's just a really good uh, resource to have around for people who are working in family drop-ins or resource, uh, family resource programs. Right. And one of the things we realized as we were doing this work was there are amazing resources out yes. there and sometimes we forget about them. Yes. Um, so this is one. This is a little yeah. reminder it's out there and it's really great. <laughs> yes. If you go on the website, you'll find PowerPoints that you can download, yeah. teaching notes, handouts, all kinds of things. So um, that's a, another complimentary it's, resource yeah. for you. Okay, and most recently, uh, last year, and Janet was involved in this work too, I'm eyeballing her, <laughs> is um, development of best practice clinical guidelines for um, perinatal providers. This one uh, gets a bit more into some of the clinical information. It talks about different medications that you need and different kind of care path plans, um, but just to let you know, it's there also. Um, some of the data they include in this report is acknowledging that as many as one in five women uh, will experience a mental health disorder during this period of time. Uh, it is a significant period of time. We also know, those of us who work with families, that this is a time of, um, it can be increased stress for families, um, in increased uh, vulnerability for women around violence in their relationships. There's a lot of, a lot of things happening here. Um, although um, the important thing, message I think is, is to be looking earlier and treating earlier and coordinating earlier. Yeah, I agree. All right, and so the last, uh, this is part of that little windy road that we, yes. we talked about <laughs> earlier on. And uh, what was happening right about the time we were really trying to pin down the kind of the focus for this particular project, it was Yulia who uh, who was uh, had headed off and was doing the training. Yes. Maybe you could. So I was really fortunate to be part of uh, the end development of this Mother's Mental Health Toolkit. And I was uh, fortunate to get the train, trainer um, training in Halifax. So this Mother's Mental Health Toolkit is um, just a wonderful resource um, for service providers out in the community. Again, their website is a wealth of information on videos. It has PowerPoints. It has a how to do group practice. And what I have found um, when I do uh, Nobody's Perfect training or staff training, um, I can put the three of these toolkits together, uh, the Growing Together, the Mother's Mental Health, and the um, Child um, uh, Social and Emotional Development, and get um, something that will fit for any kind of group that I've actually worked with. So I would really encourage people to look at the Mother's Mental Health uh, Toolkit. Um, it's a great resource, and I will be referring back to it a little bit later as well. So we were very excited to um find this out at the beginning of the project so that we could create um, yes. some resources that were very complimentary. Yes. So you'll find if you look at those Healthy Child Alliance materials and this toolkit, all the pieces work very nicely together so you can mix and match for your the, programs. The toolkit that we're looking at right now focuses on the infants. Um, and uh, so there's the, the three work together to look at the whole family, the whole child. So you um, they all fit in very well together. All right. Um, just a little bit of background that comes from the Mother's Mental Health um, Toolkit is, and we, we've, we've already just kind of touched on the fact that this is a vulnerable period of time for women, uh, but to point out that at least 15% of new mothers experience some significant mood, and that's significant mood disorders, not mood disorders in general, and many more import, uh, uh, report difficulties with coping and adjusting in that period of time. Um, a couple key facts that a significant number of women um, have no previous history to alert them, their families, or their care yeah. providers, and that many of those women don't seek treatment. And the kind of family impact and lifelong impact this can have of not being treated it is very significant. So the earlier, the better. 
um, is, a, is a key message from a, a lot of this work. I think this um, also ties into the point you made about stigma and fear and also cultural awareness. Uh, when I field tested this toolkit out in the community, um, many of the women from other cultures and other languages didn't even have terms that they could use to describe what was going on. So when we were able to talk about what it might look like for the different women, there was a lot of aha moments for women because they didn't even know what was going on. And so I, I really um, am so appreciative of the fact that we have these um, resources to use to help, these, to help start conversations with the moms who may not even have an idea of what, what they're going They don't even have a name for what they're going through. That's a really important point. Yeah. And you. I'm so glad this is being translated because um, I remember having a conversation about what kind of characters to use with the simplified Chinese that would describe what the women were going through. And it was very interesting because that didn't come, those kind of conversations didn't come easily. So having translated material is going to be really, really beneficial. All right. So as, we, as many of us know, uh, now that's the other key message that yes. we'll be kind of threading through our um, discussion this morning is that um, a lot of what, everybody is this is what a lot of people are doing already and I think you'll find that it will affirm a lot of the activities yes. that you're doing and the way you've been approaching your practice with families yes and so as early uh, childhood educators and program providers you'll know that um, a mother's mental health has significant impact on her capacity to promote healthy practices uh, both emotionally and physically for herself her children and her family and it creates that stability of self and emotional regulation for young children, which we know is foundational for their continued growth and development. And when we talk about infant mental health and know that that translates a lot into that parent-child attachment that then is the foundation for children developing that regulation and resiliency. So I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple key concepts related to infant mental health. They'd be familiar to, um, to you all, uh, there's nothing new here it's just kind of touching base uh, there the first half of the toolkit does have a little bit about what infant mental health yes. is um, where you might notice some you might have some early um, identification of what's going yeah. on and some and some first steps you can do and Leah's going to talk um, more about that but just uh, to kind of set the foundation for the definition of infant mental health and I know a lot of uh, my uh, my own colleagues that aren't in the field or the general public Infant mental health, yes. what a funny term that is. Babies don't have mental health. And so it's that reframing, yeah. Yeah, reframing of what that looks like from a developmental perspective. And for infants, it's all about those early attachments and early relationships. And this definition is from um, zero to three, and, and you will most likely all be, depends who's on the, the uh, call. call here, but will very well be familiar with zero to three, which is another great site and the Harvard Center, which has some excellent um, white paper re reports. And it's that healthy social and emotional development of a child from birth to three years. Some definitions of, of infant mental health you'll see will talk about including the prenatal period in that, and I kind of like including mm -hmm. the prenatal period in that, that um, time frame. And it's the ability to form satisfying relationships with others to play and, and important it's uh, play is a huge part huge. Of, of that development communicate learn and, and be fully engaged with that spectrum of emotions that you're going to need to participate fully in in life and of course it's much more than the infant it's the infant within the context of that relationship with their with their parents other significant people in their life family so the, the key uh, act, actions that uh, are um, required for healthy social and emotional development. They overlay each other, they're complementary to each other, uh, is that consistent and sensitive caregiving. And um, we know that to help develop that regulation, children need that consistency in their life and uh, need to know that they have caregivers who can pick up on the cues that they share about whether they're engaging with something or not engaging with something. Uh, we do know that um, that can be a challenge if you're someone who's coping with a lot of, of life stressors yes. like poverty or worrying about uh, where you're getting your food from or, or your, your housing. housing. Yeah. So um, our challenge as caregivers is how do we support developing this within those contexts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, serve and return is a lovely term. I just love it because it's, it's, um, it just tells you exactly what it's all about. 
and it's that interaction pattern between an infant and their their parent or uh, caregiver that demonstrates the the connection that they have and the responsiveness they have to each other. So if an infant uh, is looking at you or talking, you know, I was on the ferry coming over here yesterday and you know, as soon as the baby looks at you, you want to look right at That's them and exactly. engage and have that back and forth. It's it's so intuitive for us. Um, but again, if you're if you're coping with stressors and and that's where for uh, mothers with mental health challenges, yes. this can be a, a really hard thing to do. And so n- needing some kind of coping and additional strategies to figure out how yes. you can make this work. Um, two points uh, in the uh, infant mental. De- um, social emotional development there is a video of a grandfather interacting with his um, I think it's his four-month-old grandson there's no uh, there's just the voiceover of the um, uh, host of the video but it it's a very short clip of uh, a grandfather looking at his grandson and his grandson's reaction and it's a great uh, a video to show it um, to parenting classes to just reaffirm to the parents that this those those simple uh, looks back and forth the smiles the giggles that are so important to developing attachment and promoting uh, positive mental health so I think um, and yesterday someone wrote in a question saying. How, you know, this is all very well and good, but what are what happens if we're dealing with families that are facing great challenges like poverty, uh, stress, um, food issues? And um, as we go through the toolkit and we look at some specific strategies, I guess what it reaffirms to us who are working on the floor is how to help the family see that it's those simple things that you do every day that are the most important thing. You don't need to go out and buy a bunch of computers or do a lot of uh, expensive activities. It's actually those everyday interactions with your child that um, at that serve and return that's so important for developing attachment. Thank you. And the final um, kind of circle here is about the concept of repair. And uh, we, any parent, yes. and uh, we've, uh, we talked yesterday about our hyper-parenting society that we're in the midst of right now. And um, what does it mean to be the perfect parent, perfect parent versus a, a great parent for yeah. your child. And um, to know that 100% is not possible because we all come to things different every day, every part of every day. And so we may not pick up consistently on everything that our child is doing. Yes. You might be uh, cooking dinner and not see, this, it's not possible to pick up on yeah. everything. Um, and But that's okay within the context of a fairly overall consistent um, relationship with the child. It's where it's not as consistent, it's not at a level where the child gets that kind of stimulation and return that they need that you can have um, um, cracks in that relationship. Yes. If it's consistent enough, it will repair. But if it's chronic and ongoing, then that's what becomes the challenge for those that continue development of the child. And so uh, that is where in your role, it's absolutely critical, the work that you do in supporting parents to be able to work through those processes, do the best that they can. Do you want to add anything to that one? I I find the repair circle very hopeful um, because as parents, especially mothers, can be very critical of how of what's going on and people can be very critical of them so I think it's um, a really good thing to reinforce in our programs that we might have blown it one day or today it was a bad morning but we can repair that by getting down on the floor and playing with our child during a drop-in program or having lunch with them and giggling so I think really um, helping the parents see that we all make mistakes but we can repair it and that's kind of how we develop resiliency some things don't work all the time so how can we improve that, make it better, and then go on. Um, Wow, I should have flipped this right before you. (laughs) Switch this right there. Many of you will be familiar with kind of that resilience model where you've got that balance of risk and protective factors, which is pretty well what we were talking about um, all the way along. And I like this model because, uh, again, you may not be able to take away all of those things, but there's some, you work with the strengths that every family is coming with and build those up as protective processes for the child. So if in the midst of all, if parents can stay connected to their children, it can become uh, a lot more challenging when you layer mental health challenges on that. And so um, 
really a, an important role for, for you as providers in um, helping support those protective processes and keeping yeah. keeping things tipped that way. Yeah. Uh, and finally, just the concept of pile up, uh, that all these concepts relate together and that it's not necessarily one risk factor at one point in time. It's often multiple uh, risk factors that are over longer periods of time. You never know when that tipping point might yeah. be. And so that's uh, important when you're working with families on a long-term basis as well. But it's that pileup of things that can actually then, it's just too much for families. And that's when, uh, you know, the vulnerabilities really start to happen. So you can see here that there's factors from the infant and child perspective, the parent perspective, the relationship and uh, as we were just talking about, kind of those environmental factors, which um, here in Vancouver, uh, in Victoria, where right. I live, across the province, across the country, um, yeah. are significant. Yes. So in this toolkit, I'm going to talk for two more minutes and then over to Leah, is uh, there is the workbook. That's a screenshot from the cover page there. And the first part is about the, uh, for you as providers, a little bit more background. Many of you will, it'll be very familiar material, but it's kind of uh, condensed in a little bit and um, hopefully will be helpful uh, worksheets even for yourself as a team to come yeah. together and talk about your work as a team. Uh, you can also download the worksheets separately for yourself to use in your programs. This, we posted the scan for you there with web links to a lot of amazing resources. Uh, we'll have a, a poster, it's not there yet, but there will be a poster that you can um, put up on the walls in your programs, and we'll post these webcasts for you as well. So that's what will be on the um, BC Council for Families site. So um, I was really um, fortunate to do the field testing for this, uh, the Growing Together Toolkit. And uh, I'd like to share with you my experiences um, for, of the last year uh, working with it in the field. Uh, the first part, as Lenora said, the information for service providers um, has an introduction on infant mental health. Um, some of the slides she uh, has in this web webinar actually are in the book. Um, talks about how babies' brains develop, what infants need for positive mental health, what may go wrong, and what to do if you suspect something is wrong. So it has a really nice flow. It goes, it really, we really are looking at promoting wellness, going from the strengths based, what can the families do and how can we support that to the best that we can? And then if something goes wrong, um, how can we support the families? Um, I've used uh, uh, the uh, staff that, and people that I've used the first part of this toolkit with um, have found it very pragmatic, um, uh, down to earth, um, co uh, common sense and for many of them they said well we know this and I'm, that's great because what the toolkit does is reaffirm the work that we're doing actually in the field. I do have a couple of things that I just want to heads people up about. It may be things that you're already aware of um, but just a, a couple of notes. Um, when uh, we first started working around the area of mental health um, in, my, in my program a lot of the staff were very very um, worried that they would make mistakes or that they didn't have enough information um, to go ahead and do this kind of work. So I think it's really important to reassure the staff or anybody that you have working uh, with parents, uh, especially around the issue of mental health, that they're not doctors, they're not medical staff. So that responsibility for diagnosing or determining um, what kind of uh, medication or anything that the family might need is not their responsibility. They should not diagnose. And they also shouldn't be afraid of, of the topic and the fact that they might make mistakes because actually as you go through the toolkit, you'll find out that most of what uh, we're doing on the ground in family resource programs or drop-ins is exactly what the moms and the children need to foster um, healthy attachment and healthy mental development. So the toolkit offers practical help for the families. Um, it has a lot of resources on uh, for parenting advice and uh, there's lots of referral information so if you're not sure what next steps will be the toolkit and actually the websites that we have also linked you to will give you some answers. Um, we also should be aware that um, the topic of mental health can be stressful not on, only to staff but to the families as well and we mentioned the issue of stigma and discrimination. Many people are scared to even go near this topic because it is scared of the stigma. So as people working on the floor with the moms, we should really follow the lead of the mother. 
Um, we can be red flagged when we're on the ground. We can have a worry about a mom, but we have to be careful how we go into these conversations with the parents and follow the mother's lead. Um, it's good to go cautiously at first. Um, and again, the, um, the challenges that the families are facing, they may be facing the huge challenges that attachment or conversations with their children or all of this may be just seeming like one more thing that they have to deal with. Maybe one more thing, like it's just too much. But the toolkit also will highlight in our seven everyday opportunities that most of what we do on the floor and we support with the moms is what's needed. So you don't need to go out and get a whole bunch of extra stuff. And just to support the moms who may be uh, having more challenges and, and reaffirming what they're doing with their infant um, so that they feel stronger and more resilient to go through their, through their life. I've used the information for parent worksheets um, in Nobody's Perfect classes, uh, parenting classes, mother support groups, I've pulled them out and talked uh, uh, individually one-to-one -one with women in our program, and um, I've used it with staff training. And um, I have been fortunate to use the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit and the Social Emotional Development in the Early Years Toolkit as well. And I found that putting pieces of all three together covers everything, so just about. So um, really, really good resources, and I strongly recommend everybody look them over and see how they would um, can fit into their programs. What I like about the sheets, and I think everybody on the ground will love this, is that it promotes wellness and can be used with all moms. So even if you don't want to bring up the um, topic of mental health, uh, you can bring, you can use these um, in a generic, very general, let's help each other together. What I did, noticed when I was um, doing focus groups was that most people registered as I want to help my friend. So that's just a, an indication that there's still a fear of stigma. There's still a fear of being labeled. So people are very interested in the topic, um, but they might need a more generalized approach. So when we do work around this topic, I usually say, do you want more information to help yourself or to help others? And then that opens, it allows the women to develop a sense of trust with the group and the facilitator and then maybe share later that it was for them. Um, a lot of people will pull out the sheets and uh, Lenore did an awesome job and I love the pictures and notice that you're already using a lot of these strategies in the program so I use it as a chance to reaffirm with the staff yes this is what we need to do good job um, we're really supporting positive um, mental health in both the infants and the moms and the families as well uh, I want to talk about the seven everyday opportunities um, as I said, I was able to um, field test these, and uh, I just wanted to talk to share with you some of the things that came up when I field tested them and when I've used them in my programs. So this was a worksheet that created a lot of discussion in the very first focus group I planned. It was a two-hour focus group, and I think we spent an hour, um, and we could have spent the whole time on this one sheet. Sleep is a really big topic, and of course it can impact anybody's um, feelings and focus because if you're tired everything just seems to be really tough so uh, one of the, the strongest uh, reactions was the suggestion that if you if your baby sleeps you should sleep now that seemed perfectly great for me I was like yes go to sleep if your baby's sleeping sleep but actually some of the mothers reacted very strongly to that and said that's the only time I can get anything done if, if I had to go I couldn't sleep I would be, feel too stressed. So it was a big heads up to me that when I am going or any of the staff are using these sheets with parents to let them know that these are suggestions. These are things that have worked. Um, they might want to try them, but that really we are giving them the information that they can choose that fits their family. So to just reassure the family that if they're looking at these kind of strategies, uh, if it doesn't work for them, then don't feel pressured to, to use it. Um, the things that they suggest on the sheet, looking, helping moms feel, look at the cues of their children's tiredness as well as looking at their tiredness, um, developing a bedtime routine. Um, the moms really enjoyed that process to talk about how we can help our children fall asleep, so developing a routine with the four Bs. That seemed to be a one that the moms really enjoyed, so bed, bath, book and brush teeth 
And they loved that because it gave them some sort of uh, process to transition from the day into the night. And it also um, surprisingly uh, tied into conversations about screen time and TV time with children. If you have the 4B routine, um, you're using a book and not a screen. So it was an easy way for moms to look at how to transition their children off the screens. Can I just add a comment about yeah. the, the worksheets? Um, initially, our first draft, uh, every worksheet could have been 10 pages long. Yes. Lots and lots of strategies. <laughs> and what we did do is get feedback from moms, from uh, different members of our yes. steering and advisory committees, and kind of pull them down to the ones that felt like they were really key, particularly for women who were dealing with mental yes. health challenges and, and substance use challenges. Yeah. So that was the process that we kind of brought it down to manageable one or two pages. Yeah. There are many more strategies out yes. there. You will know others that your your families find effective, but that was the process yes. we got to to make it um, not a 100-page document. Exactly. <laughs> and you may find, we were talking about this yesterday, that one strategy can take a, a whole lot of conversation. So just give yourself time if you're doing this in a parenting class. Um, that it, one strategy may take, as we noticed with the sleeping rest, may take up, it's important to parents, so it may take up more time. Yeah. Um, the four Bs actually transitions right uh, nicely to the next slide, which is routines and transitions. And um, again, sharing with the parents that your daily routine actually can be very helpful to promoting um, a sense of calmness, a sense of um, relaxation in the families and the children uh, so that they know what's going to happen next. And so uh, we often use um, our programs themselves as an example of a routine. We, we put in warnings about cleanup. We um, give them transition time. We set, tend to do the same thing every day because that's really good for child, child development. So um, again, having conversations about what transitions work for the moms, what, what routines work for the moms. And also a point um, in our enthusiasm sometimes, as uh, Lenora was saying, we could have made this much longer, is to also assure both the staff and the moms that you don't have to do everything all at once. That if you just pick one thing that's important to the family or one thing that's important to the group, that change can happen slowly and you don't have to try to do everything all at once and change everything all at once. It's just not possible. Yeah, and I'm just going to add that many uh, family, uh, a, a routine today is not possible if you're yes. working a few jobs. Yeah. Um, you have uh, maybe a child spends part of the day or week with one parent yeah. and with another. There's a lot of things that make this much, it's very easy to say and yeah. much harder to exactly. do. Exactly. So uh, I totally agree that you might even choose a tiny slice. Yes. So that you know that that bedtime routine, you know, even if the rest of the day has been. Um, yeah. Here and there, a little slice of the day or yeah. evening has yeah. that element of, of routine for yes. it to support that. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be long. It can be a short. So again, helping helping families find what fits them and will will release their uh, ease their stress, not add to it. Yeah, instead of creating <laughs> yeah, more. Yeah, we don't want to create exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to create more stress for the moms. So again, it's what fits for you, what will help. Yeah. Feeding was another one. <laughs> Lenora and I were talking. Lenora is looking at the history of nursing, and, and she was saying that since 1903, feeding has been an issue in everything uh, that we that we're dealing with with moms. So feeding is another big issue. Um, and again, it's just to help the families realize that the simple fact of feeding is uh, as a, is a good support for attachment, and that finding out what works for moms, but also helping them look at cues of the child, um, maybe giving choices with the child, um, and and finding out how that might fit in your home. Um, and just to add, there's a lot more research in the last while around uh, breastfeeding related to uh, mental health, uh, specifically right. around medications or what mom is able to do. Uh, if there's been a history of um, sexual abuse, breastfeeding can be challenging. That's right. uh, substance use, depending on the substance, we now know, for example, that it's safe to breastfeed if you're on methadone. So check with your providers that you're working with. Um, we tend to have blanket public health rules, but um, particularly in these situations, it's important we get information and then support um, 
mothers and families yeah. to make the, um, the yeah. decisions that work for them. Exactly. And this is also related to the question yesterday about poverty. Feeding can be, sometimes it's beyond your control, what happens around food security. So again, just to reassure the mom, to, you know, what works in your family. So organic may not be possible. Uh, lots of choice may not be possible, but within the scope of your family, how can we help you uh, with your child? Activity and play, um, again, uh, it's very straightforward. The, the family resource people and the drop-in uh, staff that look at this uh, sheet will say, well, we do a lot of that. This is what we're promoting in our programs. And I think that's great. It's just reaffirming what a great job we do um, uh, in our programs. Um, and again, to go back to not adding stress to the moms, they don't have to go out and buy a lot of stuff. Um, mom and dad, or the adults in the child's life are their best toy. So how can you put a couple of minutes in your day to play with your child? So again, reassuring the moms, it can be just a few minutes a day, and that's and that's great. Um, the other thing we didn't really put into the into the toolkit because you can't put everything in there is the importance of different sensitivities in children as well. Yes. And um, the work I do with um, babies who are exposed prenatally to different substances, you might have. Um, a different set of circumstances where you really need to be mindful of the, the cues that baby's giving out about what they're ready and able to do and exactly. work with that. Exactly. So again, finding a balance um, that works for the family. And that goes into the touch because um, touch is a very important component of developing attachment and positive feelings with the child and the caregiver. But again, for moms that are having issues, touch may be at and I remember as a young mom, too, there were days when that was just too much. There was too much going on. If one more person, you just couldn't, you couldn't manage. So, again, reassuring families that if, if you're having a bad day or you're having issues around your sensitivity, then other people in your life can hug the child. I know that almost everybody in our drop-in program, all our staff, is dying to hug the babies. So finding people that you know, you can use in your life to give that to your child and not feeling guilty that maybe at this particular time of your life, this is something that you can't manage. And also being aware that children have different issues as well around touch. Communication, I love this picture. It just highlights exactly what babies need. Mom or an adult looking at the baby and reacting to the baby and having that give and take that Lenora's uh, slide was the ser serve and return. return. Serve and return. And so, again, just uh, the strategies highlight um, what we're doing um, on the programs and, and showing staff that if they can model that in their programs, um, support moms when they see it in their programs, then they're, they're doing a lot to promote the positive mental uh, health of both the moms and the babies. Like, oh, look, he's looking at you. Oh, we giggled when you did that. So just supporting the moms in, in, um, in their communication efforts with their child. And the last one is really useful. Again, you may be in a situation where uh, this is a new topic for you or your staff and you're not quite sure where to go next. We have found, uh, we're very fortunate uh, where we're located in Vancouver that we have great community health nurses. Um, so when we have uh, questions or whatever, we're lucky that we can phone them. And also for people who are needing more specific direction around postpartum depression or postpartum mental health issues, the Pacific Postpartum um, Society has a phone line that you can actually call. So those are also resources that Lenora has included in this great toolkit that you can direct your staff to um, consulting. So that's my um, little part of this, and if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So um, what we'll do is um, feel free to type in your questions if you have any, and I'm just going to unmute everyone's mics, just give you forewarning. And yes. We'll, and so, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're, the look. we'll, we'll give be able it a to hear everything we'll that's give going it a on. If it goes crazy, we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> mute you all again. And just um, let us know if you have any specific questions. We'll sit and listen for a minute to see if anything is out there. We'll sing. We'll sing. Yeah, we'll sing we a song. Sing. <laughs> That'll make a back a question. Yeah, we could sing Roly Poly. Tracy's trying to ask. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. Bye bye. Uh, I just get the volume up.
she's talking. Okay, Tracy, if you're talking, we can't hear you, so feel free to type it in for us. We have all these printed and sitting here. I know. And you can hear her over there? No. No. There's somebody, there's something going on. Okay. We can't hear anything, so uh, what we'll do is going to um, mute you all again. We're, we're finally figuring out the technology here. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we'll just let you know that there is an evaluation link you can go to uh, for the evaluating this session. And also we're very interested in your thoughts on the toolkit. We'd love to hear how you're using it, uh, where you're using it. Um, it will be helpful information for the advisory group for this project and also for um, the other projects that are underway in the province around maternal mental health. And I'm, a lot of people are on steering or uh, advisory committees for many of these projects and they're all feeling fairly coordinated. So uh, any learning we have here will translate to some of those other projects that are underway. And I'll turn it over to Joel. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, could you go back there? Yeah. So, um, yes. Here's the link to the post where you can um, evaluate the about uh, the session, our orientation session, and um, and then when you download the 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 toolkit and use it, you could come back to the website and rate the toolkit, yeah. and you can also tweet about it and social media about it with that little. X little plus sign there. Um, you can actually, there are, I don't know, some 50 or 60 different social media outlets that you could post it about, post about the Growing Together Toolkit so you can help us get the word out about the toolkit. And you can also on the website comment about the toolkit, about how you've used it or how you felt it has been helpful to you and so on and so forth. So it's a very helpful uh, tool and, and and we monitor all the comments that are on the website about the toolkit. So if there's something that you want to recommend or something that you'd like to see improved upon, uh, perhaps we will be able to uh, rectify that uh, going forward. So feedback and input and tweeting and twittering and <laughs> Facebooking and God only knows what else is is all welcome. So. <laughs> Anyway, um, any other? I don't see still any questions. So, um, so we have all sorts of solutions on our website for the family, um, and um, there's resources on so many different topics. Uh, we have 11 different um, topic areas, um, all of which have their own particular resources geared to parents, geared to professionals, and so on. So just take a gander at our, our website. And I see we have a question. Are there plans to share these materials nationally? Whoa. <laughs> um, I would, you know, as we, as the council, we have had many, many, um, we have many requests for many of our materials um, nationally. So I would suspect that um, there will be some national exposure uh, um, to, to the materials, we get requests from all over the all over Canada for for our resources. So I can't imagine that people won't be accessing it as they do a Google search or what have you that they'll find out about the the, the toolkit. Um, we're also going to be um, attending a conference um, in um, Ontario in um, in June. On, on the through the Vanier Institute, and we plan to promote the, not only our website but all the tools and resources and toolkits and God only knows what else on our from from the from the on our website. So we are from Lin oh Lindsay Ontario and really appreciate this resource. Oh great, well thank you Judy and Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Our morning. <laughs> well, and yeah. the other thing we'll do is we will be sharing the link back and communicating with the folks who did the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit. They were, yeah. you know, really yeah. exceptional at, at having people go to the training and um, sharing their resources. And I think the key message is we all need to do this work together across yeah. the different sectors we're working in and keep telling each other about other things that are out there so that yes. we can all be um, supporting our families. The other thing is, um, is uh, the council will be uh, sponsoring in June in Kelowna 
an orientation to the Mother's Mental yes, Health Toolkit, which I'm Lee is involved with. We we're also doing another orientation in September, October for the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit, and we'll always include the Growing Together Toolkit and those um, orient in those uh, sessions as well. So, and um, then the other thing that we will be doing is we'll be integrating the toolkit into our NPP trainings and other, you know, of our trainings uh, that we offer provincially. So, and it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, <laughs> Lenore and Lee. And um, thank you for all for attending today. And have a great day. And as uh, one of our newscasters said, uh, have a great day. Thank you. Oh, before we oh. sign off, uh, toolkit for fathers specifically. Oh, um, well, we do we do have a, um, a a new program that we're hosting called My Dad Matters. Uh, we're going to be hosting some trainings in that area. Uh, we recently had three trainings: one in uh, Vancouver, one on the island in Port Alberni, and one in Kelowna. So you might want to look out for those coming up. And we also have a um, um, uh, lots of different resources for uh, for dads on our website, but I would say that much many of the resources are not just for for moms. I mean, they're 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 for dads too, and you know, dads are parents. So, or some we'd like to hope they are. Now, now some of the other, like in Australia, their um, um, parenting with mental illness site, I believe, has some father-specific material. So there are some organizations who have done father-specific material. And the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit has some sheets there that can be used for the people around the mom. And so there are some things there that can be used with the dads as well. Yeah. Great question. All right. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you yeah, all. Thank you, everyone. Super. Yep. Thank you for your posts and your yeah. questions. Bye-bye. Have a good day.